And we're live. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, for our virtual presentation of Breaking the Ice with Angie Bularo and ice hockey trailblazer, Manol Riom. Uh, before we begin, I do have some quick announcements. If you haven't noticed already, we have an ongoing poll at the bottom of the screen asking people where they're watching the event. So if you haven't filled that out already, feel free to do so. Also, those who registered for this event and uh, purchase a copy of Breaking the Ice through Romans today will receive a signed book plate. Uh, just make sure to write signed copy in the comment section when completing your purchase. And you can purchase the book by clicking on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. Also, we'll be doing two giveaways during the event, so please make sure to submit a question for the Q&A in order to be eligible. Uh, you can do so by using the Ask a Question function at the bottom of the screen, and the store will email the winners after the event to get shipping information. And now I'm gonna briefly introduce uh, our moderator, Hannah Stifel, who will be kicking off the event. Hannah is the author of more than 25 children's books, her picture books include My Name is Waka Waka Loach and Daddy Depot. Her nonfiction book, Other Real Life Monsters, was selected as a top 10 Yalsa quick pick for reluctant YA readers in 2019. So let me bring Hana to the screen. So um, unmute her mic. All right, there she is. So I'm gonna hand over the screen to her and uh, enjoy the talk, everyone. Thank you, Rira. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the launch party for Breaking the Ice. Congratulations to Angie and Mano. I'm sure you're, you guys are so excited to be here. I know I am. Um, Angie and I are friends and we are critique partners. Um, I'm also a children's author and so uh, we see each other's work early on. I got to see the manuscript for Breaking the Ice in its very early stages, and I'm so thrilled to see it become an actual book. Um, so now Angie is officially a published children's author. Congratulations. Um, she'll be on in a second. I just want to share a few really cool things about Angie. I know a lot of family members are here, so welcome. Um, but for those of you who don't know Angie, um, you might not know that she's also an actress and she's a screenwriter. Um, she wrote a script based on the story of Mano becoming um, a, an NHL player, and uh, they are working on a film together, which is so exciting. Um, she is also a teacher. She taught second grade in the Bronx in New York um, for Teach for America. Uh, she speaks French. She lived in Paris. Uh, I guess that comes in handy when you, uh, when you work with a French Canadian. Um, she has a master's in elementary education, um, she's a, I said she's a film producer also when she was at, she's acting and she was in a Dunkin' Donuts commercial where she played a hockey coach. Um, and we're going to find out so much more. Oh, she's a runner. She's an athlete. She ran for the Achilles track club. I know that there are Achilles people here tonight. Um, Angie ran a marathon with, um, a, a blind person, which tells you that she's not just a model. She's a model person. So welcome all. And one more thing, she sings karaoke a lot. You might get some surprises tonight, but I know we're in for a real treat. So I wanna welcome you all and introduce Angie. Hi, Hana, thank you for that amazing introduction. Um, I did promise my husband that I would not sing karaoke tonight, but I don't <laughs> know if I'm gonna honor that. Um, <laughs> you so much. It is such a treat to have you here. Um, like you said, you have been a part of this journey from day one. So it's so special to have you and thank you so much. Um, I also just want to thank everybody for coming. I'm just blown away by the support for this book um, and for us. And I am just so thrilled that after I'm sure a day of being on Zoom, you all came to be on Zoom for one last thing. So thank you so much. We hope it's super fun and you're gonna enjoy it. And before we start though, I do have to give a really big shout out to my team at Simon & Schuster. They have been absolutely wonderful. Paula Wiseman, Sarah Jean Abbott, and Mackenzie Croft. Just so lucky to have um, such supportive and amazing women behind me and behind the book. And my agent, Ron Zolchan, this wouldn't have happened without him. 
And last but not least, my incredibly supportive and patient husband, Mike Musco. If it wasn't for him, I would probably be curled up in a ball under my desk with writer's block. So me being here today is definitely a big thanks to him. Okay, let's get started, Hannah. Awesome. So congratulations. Thank um, you. So I'm sure everybody wants to know, where did you get the idea for this amazing book? Oh my gosh. You know, like you mentioned, um, it all started with a film. So Mike and I own a production company and, and we wanted to tell a sports story that I would star in. And I remember in the nineties that there were women playing in the NHL. And so I thought, let's find that first woman. And then it turned out that Manol was the only woman that did that, which made her story even so much more uh, spectacular, right? That she did it and hasn't been done since. And so got to know her for the film and, and um, building that project. And then about maybe a year into the process, we were like, why are we not doing a children's book? Actually, I'm actually pretty certain, Hannah, you had said, why are you not doing a children's book? I feel that came from my critique group where you guys were like, this should definitely be a children's story. And um, and so that's how it started. And I had already known so much about her life. Uh, she'll tell you later, she always jokes that I know more about her life than she does after five years of working together that it made it really easy to then tell the story in a children's book. It's amazing. So were you already a hockey fan or a hockey player? Um, I grew up in Detroit during the time in the 90s when, when the Red Wings were really good, but I have to say that I was not a big hockey fan. We were, in my immediate family, we were baseball people. Um, but then when I started with her story, I was like, I guess I should watch a lot of hockey so I can understand what's happening, which definitely made Mike very happy because I was like, we should watch every hockey game. I need to understand what's going on. So we watch a lot of hockey now. And um, and then, of course, I was learning how to play goalie. And um, that was a whole other experience. I mean, I guess that just shows you how uh, great they all are because they make it look easy. And then you get in the net and I was like, who wants a puck coming at your face 100 miles an hour? <laughs> so I don't know how my mom did what she did. It's really <laughs> blows my mind. <laughs> I guess you were already a skater, right? You already knew how to skate. Yes. <laughs> well, 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 wow. Well, 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 I want to skate around a pond if that counts. Right. Okay. Well, I found the story incredibly inspiring, but what messages did, like, did you want to give over to kids? I think for us, it's always been about dreaming big, working hard, and never giving up. Um, Mano and I really connected on the fact that we both as kids had these crazy dreams of what we wanted to do. And it was something other people told us we couldn't do. Um, you know, for her, it was because she was a girl. For me, it was because, like, who are you to be an actor, right? And we didn't let anything stop us. And that really resonated with both of us. And I think that was a big thing that connected us. And that was something that we wanted to share with kids of you can have these dreams that people say aren't possible and you don't have to be the right, you know, gender or ethnicity or sexual orientation or, or the right background or have the right education or the right, you know, money or whatever it is. You can still do these amazing things if you just don't give up. Right. And you just work really hard. And so that I think is, is really what we want to get across with this is just following your dream and not letting anybody stop you. Awesome. I think I'm going to start hockey lessons right after we get off. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, you can shoot pucks at me while I play goalie. It'll be fabulous. <laughs> right, right. So I know you also have this dream of becoming a children's author. So, what was the hardest part for you about breaking into children's writing or writing in general? Um, you know, I think it's there. It's it's hard. I, I, what you just said, breaking into the into the industry, as as you know, um, it's it's so difficult to get in and to get your story. There's so many stories coming in that agents and editors are seeing all the time, and it's hard not to be just another story in the pile that they're that they're looking at or not looking at. Um, so that was that was really hard. I mean, I've I've been writing children's books seriously for over ten years. And now this is my first one coming out. So this was not an, you know, overnight. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we talk about working hard and not giving up. This is, this is what we're talking about. It takes a long time. Um, but I was very lucky 
early on in the process to find um, the Society of Children's Books Writer and Illustrators and to find a critique group, which you have been a part of from the beginning, um, having that support net and people to, uh, I don't even wanna say judge, to look at your work in a positive way and give you constructive feedback to help building, you know, help build it into something better was really, life-changing for my work because I look at where I started 10 years ago and where my writing is now and it's night and day apart and that's thanks to you and the rest of my critique group members. That's awesome. Yeah, we're always learning. I think what I love also is a community that people are so supportive mm -hmm. in the kid-like community. So that's really special. Um, yeah. And I know that you also write uh, screenplays and everything and um, you do a lot of different kinds of writing. So what do you like most about this process? Um. You know, I think for me, I yes, I, I love I love writing scripts and I have a novel that I just finished, but children's books are are just so special and magical because children are at the exact age where their lives can be changed by a book. And now as adults, yes, uh, books can inspire us and they can move us and they can make us think and and all these amazing things, but not in the way that it does for kids. I mean books literally can change their life. And, you know, I think about stories that I read as a kid over and over and over that gave me the courage to do what I wanted to do, even though everybody else thought it was crazy, right? And that came from reading books. And so that's the power of books. And I think that's what I love most about writing for children is they can really make a difference in their life. Awesome, that's really great. Um, also, I just, the book is behind you and the illustrator is awesome. So we should probably give a shout out to the illustrator. Oh my gosh, it totally is. I'm gonna reach back here. I probably should have one ready. Um, CF Payne no. did the illustrations and just really blown away by how beautiful they are. There's one in particular, hold on, I'm gonna show you this, where I just, I mean, he never met Mano, but he seemed to get her spirit. This one I love. I swear to this day, Mano makes that same look. Like when you're telling her something and she's not really certain that, you know, she believes what you're saying, this is the look that she makes. Um, so I think he really captured her spirit, but he also was able to capture the enormity of what she did. And you see that by, in, in some of these illustrations where you see these huge men and Mano just behind them and, you know, we're the, Mano and I are basically twins. Um, we're the same height, we're the same weight, not big hockey men size. And he was able to capture that of like, it makes it even more amazing that she wasn't, yeah, this six foot two tall woman, you know, 250 pounds and able to throw her weight around. No, she's five, six, 125 pounds and like so tiny compared to these big guys. Um, but yeah, he just did. He did an incredible job and we were so lucky to have him. He's done amazing picture books. He's done so many of them. Uh, he did Obama on the cover of Time. So when we got him on board, I mean, that was that was such a win for us. Yeah, awesome, that's great. So did you always wanna be a writer? Like did you have a dream of being a writer when you were a kid? Like how did you start writing? And like, what were your dreams when you were a child? I, from day one, I, I mean, as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be an actor. And then on top of that, I wanted to do like everything else. Like I, I wanted to be on the SWAT team and I wanted to be a singer and I wanted to play in the WNBA and, you know, I wanted to save elephants and, you know, I wanted to do so many different things. And so there came a point where I'm like, okay, yeah, that's not going to happen. There's just not enough time in life to do all of these things. But, you know, on stage or as a writer, I can live out those things that I wanted to do. Um, but what's really, this is kind of crazy. I was thinking about this the other day. Is I always loved to write, but I never thought about being an author because I just remember as a kid thinking that all authors were dead because I didn't know anybody who was an author. Nobody in my family knew anybody who was an author. So I just had this idea that like, you know, they all wrote the books and now they're all dead and these are just the books that we have. Now, obviously, <laughs> as I got older, I realized that wasn't true and, um, you know, started writing even more. But really, I don't think I really thought or believed that I could be an author um, until I was in my 20s. I mean, I, I had a college professor, oh my gosh, I'll never forget this, hand me a paper with like red all over it. And she's like, you'll never be a writer. 
And I just was like, well, I guess I'll never be a writer. You know, and it's it's amazing how one person can really affect you in such a negative way. And then a couple years later, I actually had another teacher. And this is also the power of teachers. So shout out to all my teachers who are out there um, and who are buying books and teaching virtually and all of this craziness right now. Um, you are the backbone of our of our world. So thank you so much for, for joining us um, and so much love to the teachers. But I had a teacher a couple years later who I handed in, you know, something garbage because I just assumed now I wasn't a writer. And she saw something in me that the other teacher did not see. And I remember her giving me paper back and saying, you're a better writer than this. And she's like, I'm going to give you a chance to do it over again. She goes, I want to see what I know you have inside of you. And then I was like, oh, oh, I guess maybe I could do this. And I rewrote it and I gave it back to her. And she was like, yep, that's who you are. That's the writer you are. And then that that change that changed my direction because then I was like oh maybe I can be a writer so you know what we say to people is really important the words that we say um yeah we can build people up or we can knock them down and um you know even when we don't realize that that we're doing that so okay Hannah I think we have time for one more question what do you think awesome so I'd like to hear what kids are dreaming about um did you have a dream that <laughs> that maybe you dreamed when you were a kid. But I love that you I love that you brought that up because I'm totally gonna do a dream activity. Um, <laughs> so almost like we planned that, even though we did not plan that. So that was really good. Um, <laughs> you know, actually, I had this dream um, that I and I would write about it all the time, and I must have wrote this story about 150 times in different ways, and I'm maybe six, seven years old, eight years old, of this bear that wanted to jump to the moon. And everybody told the bear it couldn't jump to the moon. And then it just, you know, kept trying, kept trying. And then it finally made it to the moon. Um, I don't know how the bear made it to the moon. I mean, at that stage in my writing career, I think, you know, I was not fully aware of like story art. <laughs> but I had this dream that I would always write about. And I must have given my mom like 25 different versions of it. But I look back now and I'm like, oh, interesting. <laughs> wonder if that was, you know, like what I was feeling about life. Like I wanted to do this impossible thing that everybody said I couldn't do. Angie, reach for the moon. <laughs> for the moon, absolutely. Well, awesome. Thank you so much for asking these amazing questions and being a part of it. We don't go anywhere, Hannah, because we're going to bring you back out. I'll come back later. later. You keep asking okay. questions, everybody. Yeah, keep asking questions, um, and Hannah's going to look through them, and we're also going to do a giveaway for somebody who asks a question. But I just want to do a quick little activity before we move on. So everybody go grab a pen or a marker and a piece of paper. I know you're thinking, oh, my gosh, she can't see me, so I'm just going to pretend like I have a pen and paper, but actually go get a pen and paper because we're just going to do a quick little thing. And if you don't have anything handy, you can use your phone, but I'll give you a few seconds to go ahead and grab it. And don't get a pencil because pencils we can erase. So I want you to not be able to erase it, okay? So go grab it. If you need to get some water or whatever, I'm going to give you a couple seconds. Also a good excuse to get up, right? Stretch your legs a little bit and then we'll get started. Okay, so everybody close your eyes. Now here's the best part. Nobody can see you. I can't see you, the other people on can't see you, so you can close your eyes completely free of judgment, okay? And I want you to think about what you dream of doing. Now this is not just for our kids that are on, because you are never too old and you are never too young to follow your dreams. Okay, so no matter what your age is, close your eyes and think about your dream. Now, what would you do if there were no responsibilities? What if you didn't have to please your parents or impress your friends or keep up with your neighbors or pay the bills? Um, what, if, what if you didn't have to hear what society said about what you should or shouldn't do? Or what if your age wasn't a factor? What if none of that mattered? What dream would you chase? And I want you to go ahead and write it down. And don't censor yourself. Don't, especially I'm saying this to all the adults out there that like ha probably had a great dream come up and they're like, oh no, no, no that's, that's ridiculous. That's the silly dream. Don't do it, okay? Whatever the first thing that came to your head is, I want you to write it down. No matter how silly or crazy or impossible it seems, just write it down anyway. Because there's something 
so very powerful about putting our dreams on the paper and just putting them out into the universe. It plants a seed. And sometimes a seed of hope is all that our dreams need because nothing is impossible. And my own story really proves that. So I want you to keep that dream, that dream, that paper with your dream and the dream. I want you to keep the dream too. I want to keep, want you to keep that with you. You don't have to show anybody. You don't have to tell anybody. Maybe fold it up, put it in your sock drawer or under your pillow or wherever. But I want you to keep it for a little bit and see what happens. See how just having it written down and next to you somehow makes it start to grow and us to think about it a little bit more. And then maybe, I don't know. Maybe test the waters. Maybe see what happens. What if you take one step towards it? What might happen? You just never know. And if you're feeling extra bold and you want to share your dream, put it in the chat because then you'll have 216 people who are going to be cheering you on and believing in you. And no matter what your dream is, I want you to know, I believe in your dream. And I believe that nothing is impossible. So go chase those crazy dreams. Okay, I'm really proud of everybody for doing that. Even if you didn't do it, I'm sure you probably thought about it, so I'm still gonna give you credit for that. Now, before we bring Mano on, let's do a giveaway. So I'm just gonna look at the last person that asked a question. I'm gonna scroll all the way down. And that is, ooh, let me go down. Who is, oh, lots of questions. Good job, guys. Keep asking the questions. Um, Ching Li, you are the last person to ask a question. And you asked, oh, oh, the, it went away. Okay, I'm not sure where your question went. I think people can move them up or down. But Ching Li, you won. So we have a really fun giveaway. We have these super awesome Manon Rayom shirts with her number on them. Break the rules on the front that we're going to give away also with one of her signed cards. Now, I love this one. Look how young she was in here. Oh my goodness, that haircut. Can we say 80s? I love it. And then we also have one when she played in the QJMHL. And another, actually, I think both of those are from there. My mom's gonna get on and be like, Angie, that's not actually right. That's not when those were. But they're three really awesome um, trading cards that are signed. So Ching Lee, you're gonna get a shirt and a card and we're gonna do another giveaway after the Q&A, so make sure you stay on, because you have to be present to win so we can email you, and then we'll give the other one away. Okay, now here's the super fun part. I am so thrilled to introduce you to my very, very dear friend, the woman this book is about, who is not only an incredible role model, but she's also a really brave trailblaz trailblazer. She's been the first female to do a lot of things, like play in the Quebec International PB Tournament, which lots of people played in, like Wayne Gretzky and a lot of other NHL players and, and guys in the Hall of Fame also played in that tournament. She was the first female to play in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, the first and only woman to play in the NHL. And she was even on Team Canada when women's hockey was an official sport at the Olympics in 1998. So it was truly, truly an honor to get to tell her story. And without further ado, everybody clap as loudly as you can because nobody can hear you as we introduce the amazing, incredible Mano Rayom. Wow, that was like magic. What I can say that will just appear on the screen like that. Hi, Mano. Thank you so much for joining this special celebration. Can you believe we are finally here at our book launch? That's crazy. It's been five years working together, and I'm so happy to be part of your first book. And you're such an amazing writer, and I know it's not going to be the last one. So it's exciting. Um, first one. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Mano. Now, listen, I can't wait to talk about your journey and for you to tell everybody all the amazing things you've done. But we have been sitting for a while. So how about we get up for a few minutes? Um, if this had been a normal year, we would have been doing an in-person launch. And we definitely would have been on the ice. And you would have been teaching us some goalie moves and some hockey things. But we're not going to let the fact that we don't have ice stop us. So, Mano, I'll pass it over to you to lead us in some hockey exercises. 
Okay, so since we don't have ice, the only thing I can do here is to show you what we do before a game or a practice. Obviously, for a goaltender to be warmed up and stretched is super important. We have to move quick in the net. Uh, sometimes we make save that movement that we never do normally. So if you're not stretched properly, you can get injured. And Angie knows that because the first time she went on the ice, she did not stretch. And tell us about your groin. Well, I think I did stretch. I just don't think I stretched correctly or enough. And I pulled my groin, which was um, maybe the worst thing ever. I still have nightmares about that. Uh, so this is super important. And everybody, again, we can't see you. So you might as well stand up and stretch and do these things because nobody's going to judge you. I'm going to stay seated, though, because I'm doing the timer for her drills. But don't let that make you think you can sit. It would be super fun to stand up and do these with her. Okay, go ahead, Manon. Okay, the first thing is going to be a skating movement, but with balance, because balance is super important for any hockey player, especially for goaltenders. So we're going to hold on one leg for three seconds, and then we're going to go to the other side on one leg for three seconds and go back and forth three times. So let's start with our right leg first and move to the other one and hold for three seconds. And I love this drill because it actually looks like you're ice skating. So this is the closest we can get to being on the ice virtually. And it's okay if you fall, because I do still too, so. This That's is a good balance, balance Mano. Right. Also, people, leave in the comments if you, if, how, how you did. Did you fall? Did you get back up? Did you kill it? Put it in the comments, let us know. Okay, okay keep going. Heart rate to go up and our muscle to warm up to stretch. We need to go a little quicker. So we're gonna do the same thing for 30 seconds back and forth. So Angie, you're gonna do our time. All right, everybody get in position. We're gonna see who can skate the fastest. Whoa, I didn't say start yet. You're getting ahead of the game. Okay, I'm starting it. Manon did extra seconds. It's starting now. Keep going. I, I like when you move your arms like that because then it really looks like we're ice skating. Everybody pretend we're on the ice together. Okay, we're halfway there. Keep going, keep going. For that long. You what? It felt good to be up on our feet after sitting for that long. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, I, I can imagine. I'm just going to sit here and watch you guys do it. Okay, five more seconds. Keep going. Go as fast as you can. Go, go, three. Two, one, skate to the finish line! <laughs> awesome! I okay. love that drill. After this, this is the time to stretch. And this stretch is for you, Angie, the groin. Um, yep. Not very flexible. You can just bend your knee and stretch this way and it holds for 10 seconds. If you're more flexible, you can use a table, a chair. And you hold like this. And if this is not enough, then you bend your knee and you can really get a good stretch. That's crazy. Or we'll do a second on each side and we'll be done. Okay. So everybody just pick what works for you. Maybe don't do it on your table if dinner's on the table. Maybe. <laughs> there you go. That is a really, that stretch is so super important because it took a long time to recover from that groin, pulled groin that I had. And it was really hard. I mean, I feel like all the movements in goalie are just this, like just stretching your legs back from one side to the other. That's what you do all the time. It's probably the, the biggest injury that any goalie has, the groin. Um, I can imagine. And then and the other side, same thing, 10 seconds. Nice. I also love how your foot is pointing to that Reebok poster where you are in the back. I love it. <laughs> okay, keep stretching. Awesome. And then also, I just think those might be good stretches for just sitting all day long on Zoom That's calls, right? How'd that feel, everybody? Everybody feel a little looser? Also, just like you said, just to get up and, and move around about. Move around a bit and move around about, that too. Okay, Mano, let's jump into your story. So in 1992, you made sports history being the first and only woman to not only play in the NHL, but to play in any of the four major North American sports leagues. What was your favorite part of the whole experience? I think my favorite part of the uh, Tampa Bay training camp, it was the first time I stepped on the ice. And we were starting right away with a small mini tournament 
everybody was divided in four different teams and it was a game right away and each goalie was playing a full period so uh, we had two goalies per team and we were playing a two period game I remember it was two to one for my team uh, after the first period and I was going in in the second period and I did not allow any goal in 14 shots and uh, I remember that going back to my locker room and I had my own locker room and it was some kind of like locker room with a big mirror in it. And I look up in the mirror and I'm like, what this just happened here? This is my first time on the ice with NHL players, did not allow any goal. We end up winning the game five to two. So I was the only goalie that did not allow any goal in that game. And I remember going to a press conference after that game and Phil Esposito announced that after the way I played today, that you may see me in an exhibition game. I mean, that I, I love that story because this is your first time playing with NHL players at that level. And you were the only goalie that did not let in a goal. And you had guys who had won Stanley Cup rings. You had guys that have been playing in the NHL for years, right? And you went in and just, you're like, done, done. You nailed it, I love it. Now there's so much to learn about your story and your journey to NHL, but you're gonna have to read the book to find out more. So if you wanna hear more about her journey to the NHL, definitely purchase um, Breaking the Ice. Actually the button right there, you can get it. If you put signed book plate, when you order it, uh, you will get a signed um, copy. I did see in the comments that a couple of people said they did not put that in. So if you just message me in any way on social media, I will make sure that you get a signed copy. So do not worry about that. Now, okay, since we're not going to talk about the NHL because we're going to leave it for the book, let's talk about the Olympics. And going to the Olympics is an enormous accomplishment in and of itself. But you also went as Team Canada's goalie the first year women's hockey was an official sport at the Olympics. I mean, tell us about that experience. That was an amazing experience. And what people didn't realize that first time at the Olympics is we went to training camp in August. And usually now, you know, it's a few weeks training camp and they bring in just a certain amount of players and you find out almost like right away if you make the team or not. But for us, that was the first time they ever done that. So in August, we show up at training camp in Calgary. You leave everything behind, your job, everything else, and you show up there. And we did not find out who made the team until December. So for all those- You're practicing that whole time? We're practicing, we have exhibition game, and you just don't know. And along the way, they would cut people along the way. So if you don't get cut, you still don't have a chance to make the team. And finally in December, they announced the team. It was like the most amazing night after all that pressure for months of not knowing if you're gonna make it to the Olympics. And then you get to the Olympics. I remember as a kid watching the Olympics and Team Canada would come on and doing the opening ceremony. I was watching and my heart was beating so hard and so excited to see that. This time I was me, like I was walking around. I had a big smile on my face and it couldn't go away. And it was just like the most amazing experience. So I would say between Tampa Bay and, and the Olympics, it was like two different experiences, but like both of them was absolutely amazing. Do you think you were more nervous for the first Olympic game or the first NHL game? I would say both because here's what I was dealing with. When I was with Tampa Bay, I was the only female. So not only I was nervous for a normal game, but I knew that everybody was watching, all the media is gonna be there. So the pressure was even more. And then when I go to the Olympics with Team Canada, I'm the girls that played in the NHL. So then that same pressure I had in the NHL, I had it with Team Canada too. So you just lived under that pressure all the time. I mean, everything had to have been just like a heightened sense of always having to perform at your highest level. I imagine that probably had to be pretty exhausting. You never would know by how you handle things that it, that it was. It was probably the, the hardest part, like mentally, like I used to be exhausted mentally from a hockey game, not as much physically than mentally. But truthfully, if you pick the position of goalie, you need to be able to handle pressure. That's probably the most yeah. pressure position in hockey. So I, I was used to deal with pressure and usually I would perform my best under pressure. 
but you know that extra pressure all the time would just drain you mentally i can't even imagine um outside of of that mental pressure and also all the outside pressure that you were getting what would you say was one of the hardest things about being the only female playing hockey on all male teams you know it, it just to, to be accepted like i remember when i was younger uh, my parents would not tell me that but i know some of the parents or coaches didn't want to grow on the team so uh, even if I was trying out for the highest level, if they didn't want a girl, they would just cut me. And I didn't know that they didn't want a girl. So I would be disappointed, but would work harder and try to make the team the following year. And uh, also, I remember some games that I played, uh, if I made a great save against this player and I was trying to shake hand at the end, he would come and punch me in the stomach. Um, Stop it. Something silly like this, just frustrated that a girl. That's not silly. That's crazy that he punched you in the stomach. And, you know, and just all the time, too, when guys were playing against me, they didn't want the girls to win against them. So their shot was harder. I even have, like, one year, one player on my team didn't really care for having a girl on the team. So he was shooting the puck at my head every single practice, and I just didn't say anything all year long and just took the shot every time. So... I am not scared of pox. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. I mean, but that's that's really insane because it's one thing to to get that treatment from other teams, but to be on your team, to have guys on your team treating you that way. I mean, I just I, I can't even imagine it. It makes what you did even more incredible because you had to put up with all of this. And I, I remember there was a time you were telling me that your dad, you had, um, I think you shut your hand in a, in the car door or something and your hand like really hurt and you had to go play goalie and your dad was like, well, crochet isn't painful. Do you want to play crochet or, you know, something crazy where basically he was like, you have to be tougher than everybody else because otherwise if you're not, they're going to say, oh, well, it's because you're a girl. And so you have just learned to live through incredible amount of pain i mean you went and played you literally smashed your hand in the door and then went and played goalie after that and i even remember at tampa bay like you had ribs sticking out and bruises and all sorts of crazy stuff and you you never complained you never once said anything about it because your dad had taught you so long ago that you couldn't because they would use that against you and i just think that's incredible and amazing um awful it's awful that they did that but incredible and amazing that you just lived through that most of the guys were really good like most of the player on my team was very supportive and really good but you always had you know some people that <laughs> doesn't cheer you you're always one or two bad eggs sometimes it's more than that um yeah. but it's also great that you had so many people support you too um, which is which is really cool. Now it's been 28 years since you made history. How have things changed for women in hockey since then? Oh, I think it's, it's so much better now. Uh, when I started playing, I was the only girl playing. Uh, they had to change the rule of the Quebec Premier Tournament for me to be able to participate in the tournament. Um, so you know, it changed. Now young girls can start playing at five years old and play on an all girls team. The competition level is really good at even at the young age with all girls. Uh, girls can get scholarship to go to American college, even Canadian college has different like scholarship. Um, and now you can represent your country at the Olympic game and you even have some pro uh, league for women. Uh, but we still have a long way to go. Uh, obviously the woman doesn't get paid the same amount of money. Um, and, and even their pro league or the sponsorship support is not the same on the women's side than the men's side. But the stride that we made since the time that I play, it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. And, you know, you look at, at the women playing now and they talk about how they saw you playing. And then that is what made them want to play. You know, Kendall Coyne talks about that. And, um, you know, we see a lot of other these female hockey players that are incredible hockey players. And you paved the way for them. And I and that is that's an extraordinary thing um, to have done, because like you said, now 
hockey for girls is such, it's more mainstream than it was. And I don't know if you guys know this, but girls hockey is the fastest growing sport in the US, um, which is amazing. That's that's so cool. And you're a big reason why, but I do also agree that we still have a long way to go, um, particularly in, in equity, in payment, and in TV time, and sponsorship, and equipment, and all of that. So we've made lots of strides, but there's still a long way to go. Okay, Mona, let's do one more question and then we're going to open up the Q&A. What was it like to see yourself in a children's book? <laughs> That's kind of surreal. Uh, you know, that I always talk about that moment like when I started playing hockey, uh, I was always playing with my brother. They were using me as a target. Um, and that moment when my dad, we were all at the dinner table and my dad was talking to my mom and said, we're going into a tournament. I don't know. Nobody show interest to play goalie. I don't know which players I'm going to pick. Um, and, and he was talking to my mom. And I look at him. I'm like, why not me? I do it with my brother all the time here at home. Why not me? And that scene, I, I, I soon I opened the book and I saw that scene. It's just like a flashback of that moment. And it really changed my life because my parents has been the most supportive people. Without my mom and dad, I would have never made it to, um, to where I made it. Actually, this is breakfast and we had dinner, so that may be a little different here. <laughs> but it happens. It happens. But that scene is just like, to me, that represent like really the change of my life because my parents, uh, supported me, were behind me. Uh, my dad taught me so many lessons along the way how to handle all, all those adversity. Um, I could have not done it without them. That's awesome. Um, yay, I love your parents too. So shout out to them. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Um, again, if you guys want to learn more about her journey to the NHL, definitely pick up the book and don't forget to put signed book plate in there. Now, I think we should bring Hannah back and answer some questions. I see there are 51 questions in there. So I'm really excited to get to these. Hi, Hannah, welcome back. Oh my gosh, I'm so inspired. And I have to get in better shape because I was totally out of breath just from stress. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed by you guys, you're amazing. Okay, so um, one question, and this is from the audience. Um, so how did you first, Angie, come in contact with Mano? And I'm wondering like, do you just reach out to like a professional athlete and call them like cold call? Like, do you yeah. reach out to like tweet them? Like, what do you do? Well, this was before Manon was on social media. So it would have been a lot easier. So a lot of people are getting a hold of Manon now to do interviews. And you're all very lucky that we made her get on social media. Because before I basically did everything short of like sending a pigeon to her. I mean, I stalked her in every way possible through her website. I had uh, somebody on LinkedIn who knew somebody who knew somebody who knew her. And I was like, hey, can you talk to your somebody to have them talk to somebody to talk to her? I mean, I was pulling out everything I possibly could because she also she lives about maybe 30 minutes from where my parents are now. And I'm like, come on, these we're too close. Somebody we know has to run in the same circle with her. And eventually actually it was through her website. And it was like three weeks later, because I think I sent 15 messages. So I'm pretty certain they actually got back to me just so I would stop emailing her. Um, but it worked. So, <laughs> so Mano, what was it like for you to, to hear from Angie and know that somebody wants to write a book or a screenplay about you? Actually, when I got the message, she said that she was from New York and she was an actress and producer and want to do this. But then she leaves her phone number and it was a Michigan phone number. So I'm like, uh, I don't think this is legit. <laughs> I don't believe that one. So no, she's like, I thought you were a scammer. <laughs> I still took the phone call. I called her and we talked. And then she explained to me that her parents were from Michigan. And she grew up in Michigan. She never changed her number. So now it makes sense. And we met. And that was kind of surreal when we met. I remember it was at Starbucks. Um, and we sat there. And we kind of looked at each other. And like, this is weird. We kind of look like each other. Amazing. You're <laughs> turning amazing. our head the same way. Like, what yeah. happened? <laughs> yeah. So someone, another um, viewer, uh, another fan asked, like, how, Andrew, are you preparing to play this amazing sports icon? Like, how do you prepare for such a big role like that? Um, very difficultly. I'm learning to play goalie. 
uh, which turns out is a lot easier than learning to speak with a Quebecois accent. Um, that's <laughs> painfully hard. I actually went and stayed with Mano's parents for two weeks um, not too long ago. To let, I stayed in Mano's old bedroom, you know, just to kind of get to know what it was like for her to get to know her parents. Um, her parents both speak French. I speak a little French, not enough. I think most times for us to communicate, there was a lot of like hand gestures going on, but we, you know, we made it work. Somehow I still was able to figure out her dad has the best stories about her. I mean, and, and totally right. Cause he was telling me things about her that she was like, I didn't even know that. So I got all the good stuff, but um, yeah, Manon has been, been coaching me on, on playing goalie. Uh, the amazing Steve Valak had a former New York Rangers goalie. Um, he's been my coach. I've had so many great coaches just helping me to get prepared. But really, I really think the accent is the hardest part. Mano, there's a very good chance you're just going to be an American in the movie and we're going to just have to let it go. Like, you know, like in uh, Beauty and the Beast that it took place in France, but everybody had a British accent and you're like, okay, we'll just let it go. So everybody be prepared for that. <laughs> So I think everybody wants to know, like, what's the status of the film? Is it coming out? Has COVID gotten in the way? Um, stupid COVID. COVID. Yeah. yeah. COVID. Um, yeah what's the status of the movie? movie? What's, what the the what's the status of the movie? What's the latest? So COVID, unfortunately, did get in the way and shut down almost everything. So now, um, you know, we're still wrapping up the last bit of financing and hope to be filming this spring. But it's, you know, the hard part about this movie is because it's a hockey movie, there's so many people around each other all the time. So it's going to be a difficult film to do until COVID um, is not as big of a threat as it is now. Um, so we're hoping spring. Um, so everybody just follow us on social media and we'll keep you posted. Um, but in the meantime, Manon and I have been having a lot of fun doing uh, some videos uh, since we can't play hockey, we've been doing all these other fun videos. So you can definitely keep up with that fun content on social media too. We've had a lot of blast. Uh, we've had a blast. My own got peed on by a goat. Really, really good stuff. I mean, you can't even write that stuff. That just happened and it was just gold, just gold. <laughs> okay, you'll have to tell us more. Um, okay. So um, in terms of book writing, like how many drafts do you think you went through, like with the process of writing before you nailed it? With oh my gosh, Mano, how many do you think I sent to you? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> dozens upon dozens. And that's after like, oh my gosh, I would 50, 60, that's so many. That's common. That's right. Like people yeah. have to know. I think that's, that question came from a teacher. Because kids should know that, you know, you don't get it right at the first time. Just like no. in movie, you got to practice, right? You got to practice. Get it That's right. actually a really good comparison. It is the same thing. Like you got, you're basically practicing writing every time you write a new draft. Like it's getting a little better and it's getting a little better and it's getting a little better until you get to the point where you can play in the NHL. Um, so I guess getting your book published is like the NHL. So it's kind of, you made it to the professional league. The same okay. thing. Right. Okay, what advice do you have for a girl who wants to be a goalie? What advice I would have? You know, you need to you need to be passionate about it. If you're not passionate about it, if you don't enjoy getting up every day and go to, to practice, um, actually, I have two sons, and both of them try goalie. One stick with them, and the other one said, "I just don't like practicing." I said, "If you don't like to practice, you don't want to be a goalie." And so that's pretty much what I would say to a young girl that wants to be a goalie. You need to love practicing because it takes a lot of practice. Uh, that's how you get better. And, um, you know, and you need to be able to handle the pressure because you're going to have. A right, right. One of my kids plays piano and, you know, the 10,000 hour rule. You think that applies in hockey, too? You got to do something for 10,000 hours before you become an expert. You just need to practice a lot. A lot. That's All the time. A lot of hours you, you need to do, but if you don't enjoy practice, if you think you can just go play game and be great, it's not going to happen. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, what were some of both of you, what were some of your favorite children's books growing up? Oh my gosh. Um, that's so, that's a very difficult question because I love them all. My mom 
was uh, still is an avid reader. Um, I think that's where my love of reading comes from. And she would always read us books at night. And I remember actually one year she got me a long time ago, like put the batteries in it. It wasn't even a CD player yet. And you could record on it. And she recorded herself reading the runaway bunny. Cause I had, I wanted her to read that to me every single night. And I would just sit, even after she left, I'd like just sit and listen to it. Um, that was definitely one of my favorites and black stallion. I think I read the black stallion like a thousand times. Um, Oh my gosh, it's so hard to pick <laughs> two of two of, of a million that I that I love. Those are both awesome. Mano, do you have a favorite? Uh, my children books are from, so it's not the same. I don't think you would know any of the of the children book that grew up um, in Quebec. We had that series Pass Cap Two. Uh, that was a TV series and they had some books and different things to it, and it was very popular when we were young. So that's what I remember the most of when I was young. Well, let's see, we have, it says we have, um, of the people who have commented, we have 12 people from Canada. So you never know, they could have, uh, be French speaking and also like that book too. That's right. Um, so my now one of the uh, viewers wants to know, um, if you had a pregame ritual. My pregame ritual started the night before. Every time that I had a big game the night before, before going to bed, I needed to see myself playing, <laughs> laying down in bed, and I was just seeing myself making save, and I know it's kind of crazy, but that was my way to prepare myself because I told myself to be able to be calm and not nervous when I stepped on the ice. Um, I had to tell myself, you prepare yourself, you're ready to go, just go out there and play. So if I knew ready to go usually I would have good games if I didn't do all my preparation um, you know it's almost like I was setting myself up for failure so the other thing too I was very uh, I don't know sus I cannot say that English word suspicious no <laughs> is that the word you were going for no I'm not going for that <laughs> oh, superstitious yes <laughs> <laughs> few English words that to this day I cannot say very well. That's one of them. Uh, Uber is the other one. She didn't call it a Uber for a long time. How do you say superstitious in French? Superstition. Close. So, it's close. <laughs> I, I, um, I know what I wanted to say. It was just not coming out in English. But I had to do different things. Like if I was like, putting like my skate first or whatever the way that I was putting my equipment on. If I had a great game, the next game I was doing the exact same thing, which had become like so crazy because, you know, at the end of the day, that was not what's making a difference. But in my head, I knew that if I did that, I would play great. Right. That's awesome. Yeah, Hannah, time. Oh, sorry. I think we have time for one more question so we can get in our last giveaway before we close up. Everybody's been so patient and wonderful. Let's get one more in. Right. So um, did you have, um, well, you know, Angie, I'm going to ask you this similar question. Did you have like a pregame ritual before you act or before you, you know, yeah. you have a writing ritual? Yeah. yeah. I mean, no, really what Manon was talking about visualizing, um, it's exactly what you do as an actor is, you know, visualize yourself in the scene and, and really just, you know, feel in it, right? Like it, it's all, and building the scene around you and the emotions and all that. So definitely um, visualizing is is a big part of it. And I think there's so many connections between acting and hockey that we always talk about, like these same things that we both do to prepare. Um, and also just, I, I think the mental fortitude is the same in acting as it is, um, completely different, different, but same, if that makes sense, um, of that, like you just have to have that, that mental strength to be able to block things out and to to find the emotions and to go deep, um, the same way that Manon has to block things out when she's when she's in the net, um, which is which is really cool to just have those those connections. So, well, Hana, I think you picked randomly a winner for our last giveaway. Is that correct? Yes, I did. So let me find out who our winner is. So and we have another shirt and another really fine okay. trading card. Who is 
Sean McCoy here? Sean McCoy, if you are here, say <laughs> hi on the chat. If not, we're going to go on to somebody else. <laughs> going <laughs> once, going <laughs> twice. Okay, Sean McCoy, much of luck. Okay. Oh, Sean is here? Oh, Sean is here. Sorry, Sean. I'm here. Almost, you know what? I realized my chat wasn't going. Okay, so Sean, you got it. Awesome. Oh gosh, my chat was way up at the top. Um, awesome. And Hannah, did we have anybody share? Was there anybody's dreams they shared that you really liked? Did you look? Uh, I have one more trading card and one more shirt yeah. that I'd like to give away. I not, uh, hang on. I will randomly go through. And pick somebody. Hang on, don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere, everybody. We've got one more. My gosh, this is such a busy chat. Everyone was so engaged. I, oh, Anne of Green Gables, Piper. I love Anne of Green Gables. That's always reminds me of you. Um, everybody was so engaged. Okay, I'm going to have, I just landed on Christine. I'm going to pick Christine. Um, Christine, who said, I ordered the book. Let me see. <laughs> Good job, Christine. <laughs> you, um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to, oh gosh. Oh, that's you, Christine. You're laughing. Okay. I think that's you laughing. So, Christine, you also are going to get a shirt and a card. Who um, wants to play for Tampa Bay? Woo! Christine wants to play for Tampa Bay? <laughs> yeah, that's what she just wrote. <laughs> I can't believe I picked you. That's amazing. Well, you're definitely going to be able to play for Tampa Bay now because you have the Tampa Bay colored shirt with the lightning with Manon's name on the back and her card. Girl, you are all set up. We cannot wait to watch you play for Tampa Bay. Now, everybody else, I just want to thank you again so much for coming. We are just Thrilled to have had you all here. I know it's late. I know you've been on Zoom all day. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for buying the book. Thank you for supporting Romans. Um, if you haven't bought it, please buy it from them. It's great to support uh, our local indie bookstores. And just thank you for sharing and, and sharing the word about it and sending so much love. We are so very deeply appreciative of each and every one of you. And we appreciate you, Angie, Manon, and Hannah. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us and to have this wonderful conversation, as well as all of the activities that you have prepared. Um, again, if you would like a signed book plate, please click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. The link will take you to our website. And just make sure to write signed copy in the comments comment section. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom when you're completing your purchase, you should see it. And if you've already pre-ordered a copy from our store and would like to get a signed book plate, just let us know by emailing us at orders at romansbookstore.com or just call the store. We'll make sure that you get the signed book plate. And to the winners of the giveaway, uh, let me, I, I wrote them down, uh, Ching Li, Sean McCoy, and Christine. Uh, we'll email you after the event to get your shipping information. So please check your email. And again, to keep up to date with our upcoming events, just check out our website, check out our calendar, and subscribe to our newsletter. Um, and again, like our bookstore is the oldest bookstore in Southern California. We're 126 years old. We've been around for a while. Uh, so during COVID, we you know, we're so appreciative of your support and, um, you know, hopefully things will get safer so we could have more people in our store. Um, I think that's about it. So take care, everyone. Stay safe. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again, Hannah and Manon. And thank you, Romans. We really loved working with you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.